Okay, so we move, we move now to the next speaker, Simon Boussier. I hope I got your uh, name right. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, he's a member of the MIP Display Working Group <laughs> and he uh, works with the uh, Ardent. Uh, so uh, Simon will talk about how the use of DSI2 and video compression is essential for the next generation digital cockpits. So uh, thank you, uh, Simon. Mm, so thank you. Um, so here's the agenda of my presentation. So first, given the SI2 display protocol is a key component of the MIPI Automotive Surdis uh, solution, MAS, I will start by a brief overview of this protocol. Then I will highlight all the benefits of using video compression, which is natively supported in the SI2 to solve the bandwidth challenge in automotive. Finally, I will answer the question, is it safe to use video compression uh, when designing a display uh, system for a vehicle. <clears throat> Sorry. So let's start. DSI is the world's simplest yet most effective standard display interface, and here are the reason why. Uh, to save pins, DSI support two way communication. It supports all of the plex using 10 megabit, lower speed, lower mo power mode in either direction. So, in other words, uh, no sideband ch channel are necessary for the control and commands. To keep the display simple and synchronized to the host, MIPDSI originally sent that time to the pixel clock and still support that uh, high-speed transmission mode today. But DSI has native support for more advanced high-speed transmission modes, uh, which will allow to enhance the display architecture, hence minimizing the power consumption of the display system. Uh, I will describe them in the coming slide. <clears throat> To save even more power, DSI support DSC and VDCM standard visually lossless compression codex. The power saving comes from a lower link rate and uh, for a given resolution and frame rate, and a smaller frame buffer if one is present in the peripheral. So MIPI DSI and DSI2 uh, specify the link between host processor and displays. Uh, this effective and low power protocol are highly scalable and flexible. <coughs> Sorry. They support any resolution display and are configurable with one or multiple data lanes. Uh, this diagram illustrates the most basic embedded display system operating DSI in video mode. On the left, the host processor contains a display engine that drives two outputs. Uh, the first one, a command and control stream, and then a pixel data stream. The MIPI display command set, DCS, is used to configure all display parameters and provide any command and control sequence required. These DCS commands are encoded into DSI2 protocol packets that are sent through the physical interface layer to the embedded display controller. Pixel or compressed pixel streams go directly through the DSI2 protocol and into the file layer. The control interface versus video interface are logical terms for DSI, but again, both use the same pins. All data is streamed through the same data lanes. The display applies the reverse operation to recover the control commands and the pixel. Today, since we're discussing about automotive application, uh, I'm just showing an illustration of the equivalent topology that use AFI instead of CD5. So in fact, the same DSI2 protocol will be used, but a physical adaptation layer, PAL, uh, and an AFI will transport the data to the display. So how does video mode work? Uh, in this mode, DSI will supply a byte lock, which is as a direct relation to the pixel clock. The pixel data uh, and the timing reference are then transmitted in real time. That makes it easier for lower cost displays to recover a synchronous pixel stream. Each element in the diagram shown on the slide recreates a portion of the video timings, both vertically and horizontally. If we take the horizontal line as an example at the bottom of the slide, HSS stands for beginning of a horizontal sync, HSA is the active sync pulse time, HSE is the end of the horizontal sync. And then uh, <clears throat> after that, follow the active line, which can be uh, RGB pixel or compressed uh, data. So it, it's quite simple and straightforward. 
Some displays, uh, notably those with compression, contain at least an input line buffer and can receive the data faster than real time if the file speed is adequate. Faster than real time can give the file time to power down or simply suspend data transfer so the switching stops in order to save power. Uh, see at the bottom the enlarged horizontal blanking period that do not require data transfer in many displays. BLLP stands for blanking in low power mode. This feature is optional depending on the display peripheral capabilities. To keep display as low in power as possible, DSI also supports a faster than real time mode where the host preloads a frame buffer in the display and then sleep while the display renders and possibly repeats a store frame. This technique using command mode transmission with the frame buffer is highly effective for, for saving power. In particular, when the display content is static, like on an instrument cluster display of a car, for instance. Video data, whether it's compressed or not, is transmitted using generic writes and through the control interface. On the display, the video uh, data is written to the frame buffer as a memory. The memory is also usually compressed. Um, partial updates of the frame buffer are also supported to avoid retransmission of static image areas. Nowadays, it's common to find mixed architecture uh, where both video mode and command mode are used. In such architectures, the data can be sent as video uh, that streamed directly to the panel, such uh, for gaming or video playback on a mobile or uh, a backup camera in the console uh, display of a car. Uh, then when the streaming does not require real-time updates, command mode using control interface will be used, uh, again, relying on a frame memory to store repeat the image uh, local So DSI2 is a standard that continues to evolve and here are the latest updates in the revision 2.0 of the specification. As seen in the previous slide, mixed video and command mode display system are offering most flexibility and power saving. So DSI2 version 2.0 now specify how seamlessly a display system can transition between both operating mode at runtime. ARP, Adaptive Refresh Panel, is a new operating mode that allows to lower the processor and interface refresh rate dynamically when the display panel is capable of long image retention. This allows to save even more power and remove the need for a frame buffer in the display peripheral. Finally, and this will be the topic uh, of the next part of my presentation, is DSI 2.0 uh, was updated to refer to the latest uh, VESA DSC 1.2 and VDCM 1.2 specification. So let's come back to the automotive application and see how we can leverage DSI2 and video compression to solve the display bandwidth challenge. So let's start by describing the problem you want to solve. Today, you know, there are more and more displays inside car like, like shown in this cockpit image. As you can see the, in the table of the, uh, sorry, at the right side of the slide, this display are becoming larger. So the display resolution also increased to maintain a good pixel density. So the total visual display bandwidth inside cars increased and will keep increasing in the coming years. Implementing the video connectivity in cars then become challenging because all this display and their display connection need to meet strict EMC requirement and be low power, which is even more important for electrical vehicles. So more display, but is adding more cable uh, to drive the display solution? No, of course not. So number of cable is a big deal, you know it. Cable are expensive, AV, they affect reliability, they increase EMI, power consumption. So less cable, less problems. So instead, with the proper architecture, it's possible to reduce significantly the number of cables and the tot total cabling length in a car. First, an architecture that allow daisy chaining will prevent from having to connect all displays to the main automotive ECU, hence reducing the total cable length in the vehicle. On top of that, video compression is definitely the most important feature that can be used to reduce the number of wires needed 
as it will allow more display stream to be carried over a single cable. Compression can also reduce power and solve your my challenge as each link could be operated at lower uh, bandwidth. As you heard uh, already in an uh, earlier presentation uh, today, MIPI introduced the Automatic 3D Solution Mask, which comprised the two key features that I mentioned in the last slide. So as DSC and VDCM compression are adapted in MIPI DSI2, Mask already include compression as a mean to mitigate the increased number of displays and their higher resolution. Given their low latency, low footprint, and high visual quality, DSC and VDCM are excellent compression technologies for the automotive industry. Note that A5 provides an excellent uh, packet error rate that, uh, that is better than 10 minus 19, so uh, it, it makes safe the use of video compression. So let's take uh, a quick look at those two compression codecs. So, VESA, DSC, and VDCM compression codecs have a lot in common. In fact, they are uh, both intra-frame codecs. They do not require a temporal frame uh, buffer for differencing. They support various color space and bit depth, support HDR without problem. They have both uh, been designed to have a super small latency, which is a key feature for several market areas, including automotive. They are both visually lossless codecs. Uh, now, what about the difference? Well, the obvious one is the compression ratio. VDCM use more pixels to enhance the decorrelation of information in an image. In other words, uh, more advanced coding tools. Uh, this is why VDCM can provide same visual quality, but at higher compression ratio. In the table for VDCM, the value uh, indicated in blue uh, are the compressed bits per pixel at which it is visually lossless for automotive application. So MIPI uh, was the first standard body to adopt and promote the use of VDCM, the compression, the latest compression algorithm developed by VESA. So MIPI Display Working Group asked the question, can we use VDCM at up to 6x compression ratio? and get visually lossless performance for automotive, automotive style image. So to answer this question, MIPI conducted a study. Uh, first, MIPI created example automotive dashboard images. Then MIPI selected the internationally accepted ISO 29170-2 standard protocol for testing high quality compression. I'll provide some detail about the methodology in the coming slide. Then visual quality experts followed the protocol and evalu evaluated all uh, image. The results were summarized in the final quality report and MIP has uh, released a white paper about this study. It's available uh, for uh, download. So how do we uh, process with visual assess quality? First, we need to work with two image. The first one is what we call the reference image, which is the original uncompressed. Uh, then we need to create the compressed image, uh, which is the resulting image after compression and decompression steps. Either a software model uh, available from VESA or an hardware implementation of VDCM capable of real-time encoding decoding can be used to create a compressed image. So the ISO protocol contains two types of tests. The first one is called the dynamic flickering tests. Uh, basically, Two images are presented to the observer, A and B. One is the reference image, but the other one is showing both, in fact, the compressed image alternating with the reference image at a low refresh rate. So if the compressed image is too different, it will become obvious to the tester uh, which areas are not visually lossless because they will flicker. Um, this is done over many trials with randomly positioned uh, flickering on either A or B side. The observer needs to select whether A or B is the image that flickers within a time limit. So over these trials, uh, high quality compressed image that are visually lossless will have the same 50% change of selection as the uncompressed version as a reference image. The second type of test is uh, similar, but uh, it's called a static image comparison. Instead of having the reference image and compressed image alternating, uh, both are displayed at A or B position randomly, and the expert need to tell 
which one by comparison with the reference above is different. So here are example of a MIP automotive test image that were created by MIP and uh, used in the visual quality testing. This image also have a day and night variance to simulate uh, a change in contrast. They are uh, HDR image. Now, what about the result? The final report shows that all image tested were visually lossless. Uh, let me explain quickly the chart. On the left, uh, basically, as you can see, if the compression is visually lossless, the score is obtained is expected to be very close to 0 0.5, which is in fact what we call the guessing rate, meaning that observer made a choice because they add two within a time limit, not because they observe artifacts. If compression is increased, observer will then start to see artifacts and then correctly if either A or B image is compressed. If the score obtained after all trials is above 0 0.75, then it means compression is not visually lossless. Artifacts are noticeable. But as you can see on the right side of the slide, that was not the case during that study. All images were visually lossless. <clears throat> okay, so let's wrap up this section about the split bandwidth challenge. With a case study, here we have a table that summarizes the pixel bandwidth analysis for seven different daisy chain display configuration, for instance, trim levels of a car model. In the right part of the table, all possible display configuration or detail with their display resolution in the chain. So let's focus on the highlighted section in yellow, which comprise the display bandwidth requirement for the display topology leveraging mass. First column indicate uh, the total uncompressed data rate for each of the seven levels for 10-bit HDR displays. Second column provides the reduced bandwidth when six to one compression is applied, which is a huge difference. Right to the highlighted section is the, num is the number of lanes uh, and required bandwidth gear level of an AFI link. As you see, most cases are possible with a single lane a5 connection. So in summary, the benefit of using VDCM is reduction of bandwidth that leads to decrease in power, EMI, and cost uh, through the interface saving. So way less cable, way less wires. <clears throat> now you might be asking yourself that question, will the addition of compression uh, decompression engine prevent me from meeting the functional safety requirement. So many displays and cards provide information to the driver that is safety critical. For instance, the instrument cluster will show icons called telltales to indicate a problem with the engine, the braking system, or even the assisted or autonomous driving system. It is then imperative that the pixel integrity be guaranteed even when the display leverage video compression. The same goes for the center console that will stream video from the backup camera. It must display all video frames correctly and avoid freeze frames. Otherwise, consequence could be serious. Fortunately, automotive industry standards such as ISO 26262 exist to guide designer on including functional safety feature and how to show proof they are efficient, in fact. So part of MASS, BP developed new specification called uh, DSC Display Service Extension, in which ISO 26262 recommendations were applied. DSC is a protocol that adds functional safety feature, but as well as security and authentication feature to the end-to-end -end solution by encapsulating DSI packet payload into set service extension packets. So the main mechanisms are CRCs and message counter to ensure all packets are received and their integrity is correct. By using this diagnostic, fault can then be detected easily on the display side and reported to the host. But one concern that could be raised by automotive IC makers designing display system using video compression is that DSC protects the compressed pixel packets, the binary data, but not the actual image itself. A decompression step using a decoder is required in the display to recover the pixel. Failure may occur during the decoding process and detecting this fault is quite challenging. An important consideration also is that 
the Tigo dead image is actually not identical to the original image that was uh, encoded in the host. DSC and VDCM are visually lossless, but not mathematically lossless coding, which means it is expected that pixel will have been slightly modified. So how can we solve that challenge? So here's the solution we have developed. DSC and VDCM algorithms are based on a pixel prediction loop, and such compression step is replicated in both the encoder and the decoder. What does it mean? It means that during the encoding process, a compliant DSC or VDCM encoder will have to generate the decoded image in order to generate the next predicted pixel. In other words, a free copy of the decoded image, the exact same image that will be generated later by the decoder and the display, is available during encoding. So we can leverage that to build a very efficient diagnostic tool. So given the decoded image also exists at the host side, we can then compute series of the decoded image in advance in the host and transmit those expected series to the display. On the display side, once the decoded image is regener regenerated by the DSC or VDCM decoder, the same CRC are computed locally and compared to the expected CRC received from the host. So with the coming DSC uh, revision, the functional safety protection is provided on a frame base uh, through FZ frame service extension data. Uh, this has several benefits. It, it is lower overhead than the SEP and the protection level is higher in the display stack meaning that we can detect error related to the compression and decompression engine. Expected CRCs computed by the host or per slice column uh, will be inserted in an FZ packet that will be transported into the DSI2 stream right after the active uh, video during the vertical front part. At the display side, decoded image CRC observed and uh, expected are then compared, compared by the display. So the reason why CRCs are computed by slice column is because DSC and VDCM encoder and decoder engine are often uh, composed of multiple parallel physical instances that operate independently on each slice column. So it makes it simpler to compute one CRC per slice column. So the frame-based decoded image CRC approach is advantageous because it offers an end-to-end -end protection uh, it is low footprint, CRC is very easy to implement, and provides a very high coverage score for both single point fold and transient fold. This makes possible to meet functional safety requirement when using DSC and VDCM compression. So we're now reaching the end of my presentation. So let's take a look at some of the takeaway, takeaway of the presentation. Visit DSC and VDCM video compression, which are already adopted in DSI2, offer proven visually lossless performance and are definitely key components in the solution to solve the challenge of increased video bandwidth in next generation cars. So using compression for automotive application offer many benefits and it can be used without compromising of, on functional safety, which is very important. So I hope you have enjoyed this presentation and I look forward to taking your question. Okay, thank you, Simon. This is uh, very uh, interesting. I think you definitely convinced us that the, uh, this is a great uh, addition. You know, the compression will, uh, will uh, help in reducing costs and without uh, sacrificing anything regarding safety and, and security. Uh, yeah, we have a few questions. Um, sure. So let me... Uh, Read the first one. Are there safety concepts that allow detection of incorrect operation of the optical elements of the display, pixel forming elements, backlight, and avoid wrong or not actual display information? If it's not clear, I can read it again because it's <laughs> quite long. <laughs> I'm not sure I would be able to answer that question. It seems related more to the the the, the physical component of the display, the LED and things like that. So it's uh, I could answer more the question about the protocol level or something, but uh... yeah, I I, I would tend to agree <laughs> with that. Okay, okay. Um, another question we have is that uh, you know in, in the compression, you, of course, you can have uh, errors in the bitstream of compressed data. Uh, 
but does it affect all pixels in the frame or the subsequent uh, frames? I think you partially already answered this with the presentation, but at least. Uh, yeah, no, that's, uh, that's an have... important question we get uh, often. So, in case of uh, uncompressed video, uh, if you get error on the link, it could affect few pixels if if you keep the sync. But in case of video compression, uh, when you get a bitstream error, it could affect more more pixels. In fact, um, the way uh, the DSC and VDCN operates is on slice, so part of the image. Each slice are coded independently. So uh, if an error occurs, the maximum it can affect is a slice. Okay, so a slice is composed of a few lines. Uh, so it depends. Uh, there's a, a variety of reason why you you choose uh, your slice size, but um, the error won't propagate to the uh, adjacent slice. But uh, <clears throat> it's more important for compression to uh, detect error, in my opinion, because yes, by default, artifacts are worse with compression. Okay. Um, just maybe. Um... Couple of questions on uh, on latency because by uh, doing the the compression you probably introduce some latency. So I think there are two scenarios there. One is you just uh, let's say raw compression without safety, uh, but I think the the safety thing introduces a further um, potential uh, latency there because you need to calculate the CRC and so on. If you could give us some some more insight yes. on that. Yes, uh, so first, uh, yes, like you said, without any uh, functional safety consideration, DSC and VDCM have a very small latency. In fact, we're talking about few lines of video. So let's say four lines end to end. Okay. Um, so usually it's, uh, it's acceptable in the system. Uh, and then you add functional safety. That, that's true that uh, the current plan is to compute a CRC per column, for instance, and wait at the end of the image to perform the comparison. So you're getting a latency of uh, detection for the fault of a maximum of one frame. So that's uh, that's uh, normally, as per many discussion I had with IC Maker and Automotive, normally it's acceptable as a, a fault detection latency. Okay, I think we have room from uh, one very last question before. Uh, yes. Go ahead. We need to. Okay, is there any ob objective comparison used for the video compression versus non-compressed video? And what amount of compression is accept acceptable for safety? I think you also partially answered that when you show the study, but please. Um, can we is the it? first part of the question related to uh, picture quality, image quality? The objective, I'm, so, I'm objective sorry, the objective comparison used for the video compression versus non compressing video. Um, I think objective comparison was probably something you mentioned in the study you made in the, the, the reference to the standard. Yeah, okay. So, I mean, yes, I presented the subjective trial, you know, that uh, were conducted during the MIPI study, but uh, obviously, prior to that, a lot of, uh, you know, uh, Comparison using objective metrics, PSNR, and other uh, standardized uh, image quality metrics were conducted, and they they, pa they passed the criteria. And so that after that, we needed to to know if you know real observer will will uh, will see artifact. Okay. okay. Thanks for the question. All right. Thank you. I think. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much for this very interesting presentation.